What's cracking, ladies and gentlemen? 49 coming at you with another community shoutcast for the UGC Dota League Season 2. We're loading into game number 2 of a best of 2 series for the Eastern Invite between Team Joey and Central Salamanders, currently calling themselves the Shit Gun Squad. Team Joey were able to take a very decisive game number 1 off the back of some very impressive Ember Spirit play coming out from their mid player Nicotic. While Central Salamanders, they made a few mistakes in their optimization. They opted to go for the Templar Assassin mid against the Ember Spirit, which is usually a 50 50 matchup. Because the Templar Assassin wasn't able to get off to a great start, because she actually was shut down quite heavily by Nicotic. And because Fleazy opted to go for the Shadow Blade as opposed to a Blink Dagger. Essential Salamanders, they just want it. their lineup just wasn't able to pick up enough momentum due to carry them through, which is bad considering the fact that their lineup was entirely built around the momentum, the tempo they could build from their snowball dependent hero Slug. He's incredibly powerful as a snowballing hero if you're able to pick up a very early blink dagger, just due to the fact that you can easily translate them into kills. You jump in on the support hero, you, you pounce him, pop dark pack so he can't respond, then you shut it out and get out of there. You're able to rinse and repeat that to ensure that every time you do engage, you're always fighting 4v5 just because you could instantly pick off one of the backline supports and you could follow one with Sadaharu on that center Warren and the Blink Stampede to provide additional pressure and support. But Sadaharu wasn't able to pick up a Blink Dagger until about, I believe, the 25, 26 minute mark, at which point it didn't matter at all. Joey, showing their confidence from game number one with the first pick Shadow Fiend. This is something you very rarely see. In fact, you don't see it at all. Shadow Fiend's usually picked up as the last hero, as the fifth pick as a surprise pick to keep the enemy on their toes if you believe that you've got a lineup that could support a Shadow Fiend since he's incredibly fragile, he's a very greedy mid and he forces your team to build to be built around him and to operate around him since Shadow Fiend, like the Templar Assassin, he's probably the biggest snowball defending mid here on the game if you give him an inch he'll take a mile just due to the fact that he could flash farm Five incredibly quickly remaining. through the double raise, give it a bring down creep waves and he hits like an absolute truck, he's the definition of a glass cannon so you can overpower a lot of heroes and 3-4 shot them before they get their items online. So Shadow Fiend does provide you a lot of p power in the early as well as in the late game. Just due to the fact that in the early game, he, no one has enough survivability to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against them. In the late game, he's got enough farm that he's just able to stomp over the enemy team. We've also got a Pugner second pick coming up from Joey, most likely going to be a core position Pugner. Just because Pugner is fairly item dependent as well as experience dependent to be really relevant in these games. As far as bans are concerned, Joey opted to ban out the Lycanthrope as well as the Slark. Lycanthrope has been seeing a bit of a resurgence with teams like EG, utilizing the Lycanthrope in a much more aggressive fashion since you've now got the 650 movement speed that does propagate over to the Necronomic Minions. And so whilst uh, Lycanthrope is much weaker as a split pusher, he's much more powerful as a team fighting hero, because the Necronomic Minions, they do output an absolutely absurd amount of damage. Since the Necronomic 3 Warrior, 75 um, mana feedback, in addition to the right click damage and the fact that Feral Impulse propagates to the Necronomicon minions which have Ten one base attack remaining. time so they actually do right click a lot faster and a lot harder than most heroes. Slark second ban just to respect ban over to Central Salamanders is Fleazy. He was actually able to pull that hero off to quite to great effect. Was able to use it to go in for those pick offs. He's now going to tie into as well as a Medusa ban. So Joey, they tend to ban out team fight oriented heroes in the second banning stage since they do have place such a huge amount of emphasis on early support rotations and on being applied pressure to all three lanes at once. Titan is a hero that really punishes that, since if you Ten leave him alone so he's able to farm Blink Dagger, he's able to win the enemy team team fights, even if they're playing from significantly far behind. And Medusa, of course, probably one of the most powerful late game heroes in the game, especially in conjunction with the Void, since you can run Void in the off lane. And have Deuce in the safe lane, use the Chronosphere to set up for the Stone Gaze. You've got two great forms of AoE crowd control. And the Deuce does work very well with the Chronosphere as a range carry, especially since you could use it to also set. Central Salamanders have opted to ban out the Death Prophet and the Terror Blade. So, two very powerful uh, push dependent heroes. Ter Terror Blade. He has been banned out just due to the fact that he now performs the exact same role that Lycanthrope does in the sense that he's able to use his illusion to be able to constantly apply pressure to lanes and be able to split push. So he's, his sole point is to be able to dodge fights, utilize his illusion efficiency to be able to outfarm every their core hero and get so big that they just can't uh, go toe to toe against you, especially since you've got the Sunder, which had the cast point as well as the range buffed quite heavily. So the 3.5 decrease in the cast point as well as the range being increased to, I believe, 300 from before where it was at melee range. Jakiro as well as the Silencer, very powerful teamfight oriented heroes. Jakiro provides you massive amount of push, which is something you never want to give to a team that already has a Shadow Fiend and a Pugna. Shadow Fiend's an unconventional pushing hero, 
in the sense that because he's able to instantly clear out creep waves, he's able to apply pressure to a tower in a similar sense. And because he hits so hard, he can bring down towers in the same vein as the Drow Ranger. While she doesn't intrinsically have any kind of push capability, the fact that she hits so hard, and the fact that she can then provide that damage to her allies, means that she theoretically functions as a pushing hero. Pudge now being picked up by Joey, they're just deciding to go for fun picks this game, so it will be interesting to see what Joey are able to pull out of the bag for game number two. Following their very <laughs> decisive victory for game number one, I believe these two teams know each other in real life, Five seconds so there means, seems to be a famine of banter between them. Ancient Apparition now being picked up by Essential Salamanders in conjunction with the Ogre Magi. Very powerful support duo. This is a very old school support duo you used to see in Dota 1. You've got the Ogre Magi that's set up for the Cold Feet with the Fab Blast as well as the Ignite in conjunction with the Ice Vortex. And so that's how you have a massive amount of lockdown as well as a fair amount of DPS coming in from the Ice Vortex amplifying the Dot from the Ignite. And then you've got the right click coming in from the Ogre and the Ancient Apparition. So in this case, Ancient Apparition most likely going to be maxing out Cold Feet. Usually when AA is picked up, you see him picked up so he goes for the max Chilling Touch build, because that does provide you an obscene amount of early game DPS. And if you have three ranged heroes in the tri lane, or even just two ranged supports with the Chilling Touch, able to output a massive amount of damage. In this case, because you've got the melee Ogre Magi, and because you've got the magic damage coming in from him, going in for a max Cold Feet build actually wouldn't be too shabby. It's a lot more efficient than the Chilling Touch. It's available a lot more of the time, because it has much less... And downtime, we've now got a Tinker pickup coming up from Joey, as well as an Invoker coming up from Central Salamander. So Joey, just going for the greedy pub all-star picks. Tinker, a hero that you actually that you haven't seen much of since the changes from 8-1 to 8-2. Tinker's actually considered dead in the competitive sense. Ten seconds due to a variety of reasons. The most prominent being the fact that the Ethereal Blade now is a projectile as opposed to it being instant. And since Tinker, if you went for the aggressive Tinker build where you go for the Blink Dagon into the E-Blade. You were entirely dependent on the fact that E Blade was instant, so you could instantly pop someone by you could blink E Blade, Dagon, and Laser in this battle space of a second and instantly kill a target to start the fight 4v5. Because there's now that projectile speed and because it no longer uh, turns Tinker Ethereal, massive nerfs to the hero, as well as the fact that Dagon now costs 180 mana Ten at all levels. Remaining. And the fact that March can be blocked by magic immune, so you can't use it to farm ancients, means that Tinker is much more of a high risk, high reward hero. He takes farm from every single hero on your side of the, of the team, just because he's able to constantly farm every single lane, utilizing the Boots of Travel's marching machines. So nowadays, Tinker going for Dagon, because Dagon costs 180 mana at all levels, it means that you're, you're getting one less rearm cycle with the Dagon, just because you can't afford to constantly be able to eat the 180 mana. So you won't have, so you'll have one less combo than you're used to, so the much more effective build for Ten Tinker, as far as 8-2 is concerned, just in terms of efficiency, is going to be the either the Aghanim Scepter, if you decide to fight very early on, or you're going to be going for the conventional Tinker item of the Sheepstick. Necrophos Ban coming up from Joey, he's a hero that's been seeing a huge amount of popularity ever since uh, Team Secret brought him into the competitive scene, just due to the fact that the Reaper Scythe, not only does it kill a hero, drop him dead, and add the 30 second cooldown time in the late game of the Aghanim Scepter, completely disables buyback. Clinks, as well as a Weaver now being picked up. So Lentif going to be what looks like an offlane Clinks. Megalomania going to be a support position Tinker. Sidhu going to be a core position Pugna. Nikonic going to be the mid lane Pudge. Actually, Sidhu probably going to be the four, the five position, since you've got to have the Shadow Fiend finding the farm. will be interesting to see how Joey decided to do this. Going to introduce the players from both teams. Over on Central Salamanders, we've got Fleazy, their one position player who played Slark in the last game to great effect. 420 Blaze Lady Rain gonna be what the face is void and what I'm assuming is gonna be the off lane. Frosky gonna be the mid lane invoker. Sadahara gonna be the four position Ogre Magi. And Cyrillic gonna be the five position Ancient Apparition. The Ogre and the uh, Ancient Apparition are interchangeable for the four and the five just because both of them are very dependent on going for the Aghanim Scepter. That being said, in this case, especially with the power of the Ogre Magi Aghanim Scepter in comparison to the Ancient Apparition, Sadahara are most likely going to be taking farm priority. But that being said, Ags is ideally going to be picked up on both the heroes if you can get away with it. Over on the boys from Joey, Lentif going to be what looks like an offlane Clink since he's usually their offlane player. Orange is a support position player. Putting on his big boy carry pants going to be the Shadow Fiend. Megalomania going to be what looks like a support position Tinker since Tinker does have the advantage of being in the jungle quite efficiently. Nikonic rotating to the mid lane as the Pudge, the big bad Butcher. And we've got Sidhu, who was the Legion Commander in the last game, going to be playing Pugna. Rotating to the top lane. Looks like he's going for some interesting items. 
No wards are actually being picked up by Joey. Never mind, looks like Orange just has the wards. Lens here for the safety ward. Rotating over to the bottom lane. Off lane clinks. It's not really the most ideal thing since it's, you hard counter it with a sentry ward. And clinks, the shadow walk at level 1 actually isn't that great. You really need the second point before it becomes reliable in terms of escape mech. So Joey decided to just have a bit of fun, go for some crazy strats. And see what they can make happen. Lenti, if going for a very conventional safety ward, this is the most common safety ward spot. And pub games, you also, and occasionally in competitive games, you also see one placed there. But because it provides vision of the rune, as well as also acting as a safety ward, this is considered to be too greedy, so that's why you usually see it in pubs. Where the supports uh, aren't as likely to be carrying sentries. Since the instant you play, you start off as a support player and you know you're going you're gonna to be facing an offlane, you want to be placing the sentry ward around here, so that way you can spot out the two most common spots. It's the reason why most offlaners actually like to place it here. An unconventional safety ward that's unlikely to be dewarded, or if you're playing very aggressively, so try be try, you place it here so you have vision in the tower, so you can see when the heroes are TPing into the lane. Looks like Clink's actually picked up the Invis rune to Lenti. Able to use that to be the leech level 2. Frosky gonna be going for the Exalt Invoker build. An Invoker actually fares very well against the punch. Especially if you go for the Exalt build, because you do right click quite hard. And once the Cold Fiend and the Forge Spirit combination comes online, you can bully him in the lane. Of course, the caveat with Pudge is it doesn't matter how good a, the hero is at dealing with you, if they get hooked even once, that completely turns the lane. So Necotic, he's just going to be patient. Once he picks up level 3 hook, is when he's going to start playing very aggressively. One of the most common hook spots for the Pudge to be the catch out the mid lane hero, especially if you're in the dire side, is sitting right here. So that way, if the creeps are on the high ground, they actually have no vision. And because it's short yeah. enough range, you could actually even go over for a level 2 hook. So Frosky, when he's playing very forward like this, especially at night time, if Nicotic decides to sit there, when the creep wave pushes out, catch Frosky with the hook, go in for the kill. Otherwise, Nicotic will be having a difficult time, since Frosky already has the CS lead. Fortunately, level 1 hook misses. And Frosky punishing Nicotic, the cockiness coming out from Joey might actually turn to bite him in the ass. The sitter, he's actually taking far priority, so it looks like Oranges is going to be what looks like a support position Shadow Fiend. So Stranger and Stranger, Fleazy, gonna be the off lane on the Weaver. As it looks like the face is void, gonna be the safe lane farm, and Nicotic going in for a kill. Sunstrike being dropped, he can actually stand his ground, not gonna be enough, and Nicotic just barely able to survive. Cuts him down for the first blood, and with that kill, particularly with the experience lead, things now get very dangerous for the Invoker. Frosky, he's gonna be putting himself in the danger zone a lot earlier, because Nicotic's gonna be picking up his level 3 hook much earlier on. Pugna, Actually takes a death and Fleezy can actually choose to go for two if he really wants to. Orange doesn't really have anything to deal with him. Fleezy could sell and choose to rotate back in to maybe apply a bit of pressure to Oranges who can't do anything, especially since he doesn't even have raise. Looks like he's able to skill it. But level one raise not gonna be enough to be able to deal with the Weaver. The high mobility you've got from the Sakuchu. One of the reasons why you haven't been seeing too much Invoker as far as the A2 mate is concerned, is the fact that you want to draft mid lane heroes that are able to make good use of runes, since you've now got the guaranteed rune every two minutes. And Voka is a hero that doesn't want to go for a bottle, because A, he gets all his regen from Quas, so he really has his lane sustain. So he doesn't necessarily need the mana or the HP regen that you get from the bottle. So you want to be going for your core items. In this case, looks like it's going to be the Hand of Midas. You, you also see occasionally, especially in the Exalt Invoker, Something like a Yule Scepter Rush, so you can use it to set up the assassination combo where you Yule them into the air, drop the Sunstrike, and then you invoke the Deafening, Deafening Blast into Meatball, or just the Meatball, to be the follow through. Lentif having a difficult time, but he has picked up some CS, so he's just going to be waiting until he finds experience. The reason why you usually don't see Clinks as an offlaner is he's very timing dependent. If you're going for the Auckland Malevolence, you want to rush it and pick it up by the 16-17 minute mark. Because that's when you, you've hit your power spike, when you're able to r rotate around the map, find a single hero, kill them before they can do anything, and then just zip away and start to snowball and apply pressure through that. Or if you go for the much more new school build of the Solar Rings of the Blink Dagger, Nikonic, whips the dagger and Frosky, punishing him, actually could be going in for a kill, as Fleezy actually also rotates in. Ford Spirit, gonna be nibbling away at Nikonic's armor. So we're like actually running shoes as well. Pause coming through. It's only got the one point in the chilling touch. 
And that's a level 3 hook. That's going to take out half his life. It's the Ancient Apparition. Looks like he's doing a bit of a throw. That's 420 Blaze. Going for the conventional faces Void build, maxing out the time lock. So once he, the instant he hits level 6, he can go for a kill over in Lenti. Turns out there are a few technical issues with the Ancient Apparition. Apparently his mouse has stopped working. Still calling out 1v1s in the codec. More than happy to oblige. Looks like we're going to be seeing an, an easy kill for the codec. In the mid lane, the rest of his team, too far away to be the help out. Nicotic, easy hook, Sunstrike flies through, chilling touch damage, but not going to be enough, and Pudge finds himself another easy kill. Sadaharu, smoke just wore off, wasn't it too successful as he wasn't able to find anybody with it. If he'd rotated with the Ancient Apparition, would have been able to find himself a kill on the Pudge, especially with the follow-up from the Sunstrike. Oranges, take that boots, looks like both teams are having a bit of fun. Soul Ring not being used. Over on Pugna. Bit of a risky pickup on Pugna just because he is so fragile. But that being said, once you get level 6, you can just use the life drain to be there to keep yourself topped up. So you usually see arcane boots picked up for Pugna for mana sustain. Just because as a hero with one strength gain per level, you really can't afford to play dice with your HP. Fleazy, looking to go for a kill, but Sakuchi's on cooldown. He might actually put himself a bit too far out of position. Eats the E rays. Unfortunately, it was the E race, not W race. If it was a W race, it could have gone for the kill. But Sidhu able to find it with the Nether Blast. It's a good team mode coming up from them. Frosky gets hooked in by Nicotic. Cold Snap being used, but Dismember is now there. And this is why the lane becomes so much difficult. When you lose even just a single kill to the Pudge, because he's going to pick up level 6 before you do. And he's going to have that combo where you hook him, then you Dismember him. He'll start to exert his influence across the map, especially with the Tranquil Boots pick up. Senaharu goes in with the Ignite. Fire Blast being used as well. Lentif does break the Cold Feet. Hiding in the tree line, the Sentry Ward has been dropped, so Lentif can't actually run out without being revealed. So he's just going to sit there, just waste the time to support until they back off, and then Lentif could choose to zip on out. So good play coming out from Lentif, he didn't panic and immediately try to run away. Would have led to his death otherwise. So Joey making their Pentacore lineup work. Fleazy. The bottle pickup is going to be going in for the top room, but Nicotic is there. Kid going for the hook, picks up the Invis rune, he's got the dismember available. Fleazy doesn't have time lapse. Could actually go in for a hook through the Invis, but not going to be enough. Sakuchi now wearing off, doing a bit of chip damage, but Nicotic has that Invis rune. Nicotic now looking to go for a kill over on Frosky. Frosky nowhere near his hand of Midas. Midas is a fantastic pickup on the Invoker because it gives you the EXP lead from the triple EXP you get when you transmute a creep. Looks like Nicolic was able to find a kill over on the Weaver, even without this member, so it just looks like it was a hook kill. The biggest weakness of Weaver is he's got the lowest stat pool in the game. The average hero stat pool at level 1 is about 52 to 53. Weaver starts with a combined stat pool of 44. So he makes up for it. It's to balance out the fact that Sakuchi would otherwise be completely overpowered. On a hero that had a bit more survivability, Lenti. Throwing a few cheeky right clicks with the Searing Arrow. So really, he looks like he is going in for the Chilling Touch build. Does make a lot of sense since you've got the Faces Void, so the Time Lock in conjunction with the Chilling Touch. Absolutely retarded amount of DPS coming out from those two. Fleazy, inside the Nether Ward uh, region, is actually taking a fair amount of damage. He can't Sakuchi into going for Lasses without copying a Blast. So he's going to do so anyway, and he's not regening any mana since he's inside the nether ward. Negative AoE. Orange is now taking the mid lane, so this is the strength of the Pudge. Because he's going to be, once he hit, picks up level 7, he's going to be rotating around the map to set up kills. You can send one of your supports, or in this case another core hero, into the mid lane. It's Megalomania, completely uncontested. Just been sitting there doing his thing. This is something that Myth Trust were the ones to really innovate this. About two years ago, back when Tinker was first experimented as, as a jungle hero. Nikoli looks like he was able to find this a very successful kill. In the bottom lane, he actually picked off. Actually, Fleecy actually picked off by uh, Sidhu. So they uh, do trade call for call. Nikoli puts a haste ring up. He's going to find another kill. Hook flies in. Great hook coming out from Nikoli. Sadahara 
Tries to keep himself alive, but Lanty cleans him up. Nikoldic still has the haste room. Gonna be going for a kill in Cyrillic. Hook can we pull out one more second? Throws it at the hook, unfortunately, whiffs. But he's just gonna back himself until he's out to the vision rage, continue to threaten with the hook. It's the biggest threat of the punch is the fact that the instant he's missing, you have to play a lot more defensively. You have to adopt a defensive posture, you have to position yourself there. So that if, since the hook's most likely gonna be coming from this direction, you put as much distance from yourself and the hook as possible. Lenti actually gets hooked out of the chronosphere. Tactical punch hook saves him from the sunstrike that was incoming. 420 blazed. Not going to be too happy with that. Wasn't able to find a kill with this Chronosphere. That's a very long cooldown. Chain, it looks like the cold snap is being used. Frosty actually opted for an early value point. The West get oranges. The support position Shadow Fiend. Zoning them out with a few cheeky raises. What is this game? Lentiv actually was able to find enough gold to buy a 9 minute Midas on an offlane 1v3 clinks. He might be a wizard. Fleezy being quite handily zoned out by Sudo. Can't actually go close to him without risking death from another blast. So Sudo should be able to just keep chipping away at the tower. Looks like he's going for a fairly conventional pumpkin build. Maxing out that nether ward to apply a lot more pressure, especially on a hero like the Weaver. Who's so heavily dependent on going in for the Sakuchi. The nether ward also means he can never go in for a kill. So if he throws out the swarm, he's going to eat so much damage that Sudo could just instantly kill him with the nether blast. Life drain is casually being used with the soul ring. So Sudo's going to be sitting there topped up. And every time he gets the Sakuchi damage, he just throws out another blast. Swarm flies through, Weaver eats 120 damage from that. Not gonna be too pleased. He does try to go in for the deny, but another blast is there. Top tower has fallen. Not so oranges with the tranquil more. boots. We are gonna be seeing a complete support position Jedophine. No attempt to even go for conventional items. Lentif scouting out the Sadahara as Nicotic is winning the wings, goes in for the hook, actually holding onto it, realizes that he would be the fine the Sadahara. That's juking left and right. Ford Spirit gets devoured by the Dark Pack. Sanaharu instantly starts running on home. He knows the clinks there. Doesn't want to tangle with him. Frosky has picked up his own Midas, so he has recovered. He actually is leading the CS scoreboards in terms of overall last hits. Courier, has been slain. courier being sniped. Was it by Lenti? Very surprising. Oranges actually finds a solo kill on Fleezy, despite being a support position in Shadow Fiend. Now <laughs> going for what looks like a Rather Valley with the Vitality Booster. One right click in the Earn Damage should be enough to actually bring down Cyrillic. Fortunately, Nicotic isn't going to be getting the Flesh Heap charges from that since he wasn't within 200. Actually, he might get it just because he got the kill. Yeah, never mind. Because he's got credit for the kill, he still does get the Flesh Heap charges. Megalomania now has his Boots of Travels. So the Nike Airs of Sanahara. Caught inside of the Crab Flying. Going to be drained by Sidhu. Netherworld prevents Frosty from chasing until he deals with it. Netherblast flies through. 420 blazed. He just got his coins for off cooldown. You can choose to commit for a kill over an Oranges. Oranges is actually at high risk because you got the time walk into the coin sphere. Fleezy throws down the swarm. Continue to apply pressure. Soundstrike flies through. It might actually be enough damage from Fleezy alone. But the Decrepify is there. Sidhu able to keep himself alive for a bit longer. And Oranges throws in a raise. Unfortunately, Whiffs takes the death. But it's your four, it's your five position Shadow Fiend, not the end of the world, considering you've got a Tinker free farming. Under attack. I feel sad for them. And once again, trash talk coming out from both teams. 420 Blaze going for what looks like the Mask of Madness, so fairly standard build order for him. Pudge looking to go in for an angle for a hook. Almost catches out Fleezy, but sells for the consolation prize of the double damage. So they're doing what Pugna does best, just knocking down towers, so while Pudge exerts pressure across the map, Pug knocks down your towers. The two heroes of Pug and the Pudge actually do make a fair amount of sense in terms of their overall synergy. But Sidhu unfortunately caught out of position, could be taking a death. He craps himself to avoid the last right click from Frosty, but the Ignite's gonna be enough to be able to burn him down. It's a bit unfortunate. That being said, it is a level 1 Ignite, and he does barely live. So the Soul Ring regen actually saving his bacon. Sadaharu. Realizing that he's not gonna find the experience to go for a max Ignite build after the Fire Blast, opts to go for the value point. And the Bloodlust, so he's going to be prioritizing Bloodlust over Ignite. It's usually, if you know that you're going to be finding reasonable experience, you can opt to max out the Ignite after Fire Blast and forego the Bloodlust until later on. Since until you get level 2 multicast, it is, it's fairly inefficient use of your mana, so it doesn't last for too long. But if you're so far behind that you need to find some kind of kill, the value point in the Bloodlust can make a lot more sense, especially if you've got a hero like a Faces Void. You can make a pretty good use of that. 
Radiant structures are fortified. Don't wait. Lenti gets scattered out. 420 Blaze does drop the Chronosphere. Sunstrike also flies the D crack. Keep himself alive. And now Meatball now drops. Lenti is still alive. By the grace of the gods. And Sidhu, he's now going to be the one that might look to go in on. Cold feet being used. Sidhu actually might freeze himself since he's stuck around for a very long time. But never mind. He is able to break it. Nicolic, no earn charge. Looks like he's going to be going for a four staff. Could go for a whole cover on Cyrillic. Is very low. 420 Blaze actually walks into the tree line. He's actually caught himself completely frozen. Ancient Apparition walks away about 4 HP. No big deal. 420 Blaze keeps himself alive. Blind hook from the tree line from the Kodic of Fishing Hook. Doesn't latch. He does catch up. Frosty could actually use the Dismember to buy a teammate's time to be going for this. Now he's going for a point blank hook. That'll be enough to go for a kill. But unfortunately, the entire team of. Essential Salamanders, wasn't that? So they're able to bring him down, Sadahara. Start smacking down the Netherworld before it drains all his mind. He's able to find a cheeky man to farm from that. And Sidra actually has his Dagon. So the Decret into Dagon combo, quite devastating. Especially since you also have the Tinker to make good use of the uh, increased magic damage you get from Decret. Megalomania goes in over Cyrillic. The march damage should be enough. So Blink Dagon now available on Tinker. And Team Joey, if we have a look at the gold graph, about a 10,000 gold lead in their hands. 7,500 experience lead. Joey making their Pentacore lineup work through magic or pure skill. Nicolic hasn't really been too great with his hooks in the last few minutes just because the enemy team's been so paranoid about them. Frosty with that value point and Wex has gotten Deafening Blast as disposal. He's going to go for the Yule Scepter. So once he gets that. The Quas Exile Invoker burst combo is real. Life Drain being used on the creep to draw aggro away from the tower. Sidhu, because he's got the Soul Ring, he could do whatever the hell he wants. He knows that it's not going to be a critical loss. His Life Drain has such a low cooldown. Phase Boots being picked up on the Weaver. This is a very unconventional build. It's something you see in Southeast Asia, where you want to maximize the damage. Otherwise, Weaver, you want to go for Treads for the survivability. In terms of overall DPS, the Phase Boots actually does make a lot more sense. But Orange it looks like he finds a cheeky kill. Pops a clarity as well. Almost has the Rod of Alley. So that ensures you're able to instantly land all three raises. Just five position Shadow Fiend things. Megalomania just doing his thing now in the enemy jungle. Some Cloud 9 efficiency coming up from him as he farms three camps at the same time. 420 Blaze now has his Mask of Madness. So, so long as the Pugna is not able to decrap or they get hooked out, he does go on Sinner, so no decrap for you, sir. Sunstrike flies through the Fire Blast from Sanaharu, just in case. 420 Blaze, finally able to translate a Chronosphere into a kill. Nicotic smoked up, never mind, looks like it's an Invis Rune. He might look to go 1v4 again. This time it's only 1v3. He could actually pick off 420 Blaze. He doesn't have enough mind to time walk. And he's got support coming in from Oranges. Hulk flies through. Requiem, and it just completely styles on the multicast on the corner, keeping Sanahara alive for now. The Argus actually doesn't even have mana for raise, just throws in one more right click. Frosgate stands his ground against Nicolic. Nicolic should be taking a death. This is the double force spirit cold snap combination. He actually denies himself. Great play coming up from him. And Orangus should be taking a death with Fleezy committing for this. Tries to juke him and deny himself to Roshan, but Fleezy's able to run him down. That face boot damage, trying to pay for itself. But Lenti, doing what Clink's does best, well, end, well the rest of his team top tower is under attack. messing around the enemy. The split pushes, utilizing the Searing Arrow as well as Strafe combination to just deal obscene amounts of damage. Lenti hasn't bought any items yet. We could be seeing something like a Blink Dagger. Or if he decides to go for the Orchid, you still will be finishing it in the next 3 or 4 minutes, so it wouldn't be the latest Orchid, all things considered, especially since he was the 3 position. Clink's against the 1v3 tri -lay. Radiance Metal Tower is under attack. Sedahara. Now has that multicast, was able to use that to keep himself alive for a little bit longer. Yule Scepter now available for the Invoker, so he's got that burst combination. Cyclone, Sunstrike, and then the Meatball to follow up. You've also got the Deafening Blast, but usually the two of them is going to be enough to be able to instantly pop a target. Megalomania just holding on to his gold for now. Probably going to be going for something like a Dagon, given the state of the game with the Pentacore lineup. When one of your teammates decides to go for a Dagon, you go all in. 
Radiance bottom tower has seen better days. Nikolic. He's still going for the conventional four star. Just being a constant nuisance, this is the Dyer's biggest power is under of the pods. The fact that once you get your core Dyer's items, you've got level seven, switches. you just rotate. You just you never have to be in a lane again, especially with Tranquil Boots, the Urn, and the Bottle. So if the enemy team doesn't have sufficient ward coverage, they're going to constantly live in fear. Lenti, if Duking against Fleezy, should actually be the finest kill. Force Fleezy to be the time walk, time lapse at least. So Fleezy making good use of the face boot damage, and he actually opted for the Mal for the Maelstrom. So the fact that Jamnet attack now procs unique attack modifiers, but he could be taking a death. He walks into the march. Fortunately, those little robots, they don't carry candy, they carry death. Dagon flies through over and Frosky. Aaron just TPs in, juking him out, Sada Haru spots him a little bit too late, and Cyrillic gets hooked in and smacked down by Pudge. Two games the colleagues have really been showing off his ability as a mid player. 420 Blaze, tries to take a tower, actually time walks out immediately, despite the fact the city was completely out of mana and dependent on the soul ring. If he checked mana pool, could have actually opted to go for his kill attack there. Frosty gets hooked. So the Kodak's able to bring him down again. He's got his 4 staff now available. Could actually start saving gold for a blink. So you've got the blinking 4 staff in Tactical Pudge. Especially since there's the face's void in the field, so you could use it if your reflexes are fast enough to blink out before he chronos you. So you can hook out the rest of your team. Fleezy. Playing aggressively, the Sentry Ward's being dropped and he's got 800 HP. He gets caught up with a hook, loses half his life, forced to use time lapse to keep himself alive for a little bit longer. The Requiem comes out from Oranges. The Dark Lord, Lord Voldemort, styles on you, takes your soul. Lenti, throwing a few right clicks, he's still holding on to his gold. He's got 4k, he can choose to outright buy and finish the Orchid Malevolence if he wants to. Megalomania diving into the enemy tier 3, hook flies in, pulling him out of harm's way. Those out cheeky march, and he's gonna rearm get back home. Linty, looks like he's gonna feed. Once again, Nicolic bailing out his teammates this time with the 4 star. Recently finished. 420 Blaze, looks like he's gonna be going for his own Maelstrom. Fairly conventional Faces Void build. Faces Void and Weaver, you can see them kind of as two sides as far as itemization is concerned with carriers. Faces Void gets more damage by building attack speed early on because you've got the time lock. Whereas Weaver gets more overall DPS by just building damage because you've got Geminate attack to effectively serve as your attack speed modifier. Although that being said, you usually do want to go for treads over phase just because you're so squishy that you really can't afford to walk around with a thousand HP 20 minutes into the game. Considering Pudge can drop half, Pudge and the tanker can instantly take a third of your life out with the hook or with the laser. Nicole unfortunately just hooks in the forward spirit, smacks it down. Gets the consolation prize of the gold. Instant sentry ward being dropped as they realize the only way Pudge could have hung around there and chosen to go in for a hook like that is if they had wood. 420 Blaze. He will be finishing his Maelstrom fairly soon. Central Salamanders. They do have very potent team fight if they're ever able to get a good Chronosphere. Because they've got enough damage, enough follow up to ensure that they start a fight 4v5. That being said, Joey, because they have such a massive uh, gold lead, especially with the Bloodstone, first coming in from Megalomania, incredibly unconventional build, could have actually gone for a Sheepster or an Aghanim Scepter, would have been much more effective. Bloodstone's an ultra luxury late game item on the Tinker. Once you've got your Dagon 5 and your E Blade, if you want to play very aggressively, because it lets you blink into the front line, so if you happen to die, you, you're going to be coming back to life a lot early on, so it's to make sure that you're not entirely dependent on your buyback. It also does give you that buffer of HP and mana, so you've got another rearm cycle. But predominantly, you pick it up if the game goes past the 50 60 minute mark, and you're going to be worried about buybacks. And so, if you're able to build enough charges, you just pretty much instantly come back to life. Oranges. Now, the Rod of Alley picks up the mech. It's the mech Shadow Fiend. Is actually a fairly legit build as far as the competitive scene is concerned, just because Shadow Fiend's biggest weakness is lack of survivability. So, if you're able to pick up a very early mech, you can fight as five with your team to exert a lot of pressure early on to take enemy towers and to take these fights. Looks like Megalomania, just kind of cheeky kill on Fleezy. So 9 charges on that Bloodstone. Because he's just been sitting there farming, the Bloodstone does it increase his overall efficiency. So in this case I guess you could consider it a farming Bloodstone. 
So the Haru does have the Arcane Boot, so he can now actually afford to spam out the Fire Blast every time it's off cooldown in these fights, if he's able to stay alive that long. So really, gotta be very careful. Nikolic throws out the hook, unfortunately whiffs, bit of a questionable hook coming up from him. Rare miss. And Cyrillic, with the Ice Ball check, scouts out the Nether Ward's able to bring it down. Decrypt doesn't come out in time. Good recognition from the Ancient Apparition. The Radiance should really do something about that Middle Tower. Radiance gonna be picked up by the Clinks. Joey really seemed to like going for Radiance as the BM item. Fortification in place. So you could burn or you burn. Hook flies out, catches out Fleazy, he does instantly Sakuchu. Lenty pops the skeleton walk. Realizes they've dropped a sentry. The great escape coming in from the clinks. He can actually choose his turn around on Sadahara. The Radiance burst on the two work. 420 Blaze. Time walks back. Looks like Sin was able to take a tower while that's happening, so space created, says Lenty. Oh, that's not good for the Radiant. Fleezy gonna be going for what looks like a BKB just to increase the survivability. With that being said, with the way this game is going, wouldn't be surprised if we saw Assange and Yasha coming in from the Weaver. Definitely seen Stranger Things. So the Haro drops, another Sentry Wall just barely catches out Lenti. Chronosphere being committed, this time it catches out Nikolic, so there's no tactical hook for you. They choose to go on Nikolic as well. This could be a potential turnaround for Central Salamanders. The Rod of Alley being used on 420 Blaze to be the snare him. Or just goes in for the Requiem to tell him to get back. And 420 Blaze gets Dagon as well as raised down. Hook flies through, unfortunately, whips Nikolic. Could actually choose to force stuff himself forward and go in for the Dismember. Megalomania. So it's a join in the fun. Gonna be spamming out the March Machines, laser combo, is able to use it to bring down Cyrillic. Hulk goes in, catches out one, and Megalomania cleans up three. Good plays coming out from him. This time, you'll cycle it into the air, it guarantees that the cold feet should prop. And that could be a death for Megalomania. Never mind, actually able to blink out. Despite taking instances of damage, so great reflexes on him, rearming then instantly blinking before he took another instance of damage, which would have reset the blink cooldown. So all in all, Joey able to get away with murder. They didn't lose anybody too important. Lenti with the Radiance, using it to farm. So that efficiency coming up from the clinks. Not only does he burn you, all he burns you can also increase his farming speed. Megalomania says, come take care of these mud gongs for me. I believe Searing Error is one of the few abilities that does affect the mud golems because it's a physical ability. The same sense it works on towers. Lentif goes in over and flees, but Fleezy immediately knows he's there because the Radiance Burn. If Lentif wanted to be super next level, he could actually choose to disable the Radiance Burn until he's choosing to commit to a fight. Or rather to a pickoff. Orange just goes in from the other side, blocking off Roski. Roski's gonna die to the dot damage, the Radiance is actually paying for itself. Chronosphere unfortunately does catch out Lentif, so I should be able to bring him down. Oranges. Goes and throws off a few rays, he doesn't have enough of the Reckon, but with the mech, keeps Lenti for life for a little bit longer. Ford Spirits finally bring him down, but they have to kill, they have to trade 420 for that. And Fleezy, looks like he killed Nicolic, meanwhile in the mid lane. Not even using the time lapse. Gotta be very careful though, as Megalomania, now joining the party, doesn't have a sheep stick though, so he's mostly just gonna be, you know, just be spamming his abilities. So we're like, walking through the march, and then just instantly eats a laser to the face and dies. Questionable play coming up from him. You never want to chase a tinker through a march if you're a support hero. Because even if you do get the kill, you're going to be dying to the march damage afterwards. Fleezy, getting smacked down by Shadow Fiend. This is a support Shadow Fiend with no damage items with a rod of Owie and a mech. Almost dealing enough DPS for to bring down Fleezy and Fleezy. Forced the time lapse so he didn't instantly die to Megalomania's laser missile combo, but he might do so anyway. Rod of Owie being used, not going to be enough. Oranges might go for some Yaf at some of the players with the E rays. Not able to do so, it's 420 Blaze. Then comes back in. But looks like the missile from Megalomania is going to be enough. Megalomania doing that Tinker does best. Just constantly spamming missiles to zone up the defenders while you take their tower. Should be able to do so. And Sidhu, he's actually been fairly quiet for a little while. He's got his own Bloodstone. So Bloodstone gaming coming out from Joey. 420 Blaze. Does have his Maelstrom, now needs a Sheep Sticks, uh, BKB so he doesn't instantly get hexed for the duration of the fight or exploded. So the sheer amount of burst damage coming out. Megalomania with a Sheep. This is, these are items that you usually see on the core position Tinker that's had great farm. Nikolic just doing his thing. And I don't mean in love. 
pulls him. Dismembers him. Sitter, just being Sitter. Nicolic now with a blink dagger, so blinking four star from Pudge, the dream is real, Sitter. Four star from Nicolic saving him from the meatball damage. Megalomania just blinking into the team. Not really too sure that's his base, but he's keeping himself alive for now. Still is able to stay alive once again using the rearm blink. Lenti, unfortunately, is going to be the sacrificial lamb. So the, the offlane blink sacrificed himself for the jungling tinker. The state of the game is unusual. Fleezy goes in for the kill with the lack of treads. Nikolic just kills him with the rock damage. So the burst coming in from the D-Crack into the Dagon. More deeps than Daenerys Targaryen. Megalomania. It's a five loss. Could actually choose to go for a kill. Turns him into a pig. Laser actually jukes out the hook even though he's a pig. That's one smart pig. But the laser does turn him to bacon. Megalomania actually BOTs back home despite the fact he had half mana. So a slight inefficiency play coming up from him. But that being said... Joey, that, at this point, they could do whatever they want to. They could sell all their gold, all their items, use the gold to buy an army of couriers. They still would be in commanding lead of the game. Pudge could actually opt to just go for a carry build and pick up something on like a Soul Karas. Frosky gets turned into a pig. Megalomania once again doing his thing. 420 Blaze catches out three with a great Chronosphere, but he, is, he almost dies inside his own Chronosphere to the shaman of damage from Megalomania. This is the power of the Tinker with that Sheepstick. Even though the hero was nerfed into the ground, if you let him farm a Sheepstick, he's still gonna chain hex you to the, until you can't do anything. And then be able to bring you down that way. Oranges! The five position Shadow Fiend going toe to toe against the entire team. Fleezy pops his BKB, unable to find the kill on the 5. Megalomania just rearming, just waving his arms around while all this is happening. Radiance leaving Orange to his plight. Orange just calling out Fleezy. Honestly, who buys a BKB? You think he threw his shoe? Megalomania, the cheeky blink hex. Great aggressive ward being placed by Joy to give you vision of high ground. Something to point out. Krosky, just trying to find his farm. He's going for a zoo build, so he actually went through a bit of a split evoker build. Usually if you go across Exile, you go for Yules or you go for Necronomicon. If you go for the zoo invoker build, it's a timing specific item. You want to get it by the 25 minute mark. You need Necronomicon 3 by that point. So you don't mess around with the Midas or with the Yule Scepter. Or if you do go for the Midas, you still can go Midas into Necro if you have given enough farm. Otherwise, the, the whole point of the zoo build is that you're able to take control of the game in the first 25 minutes. Otherwise, it'd be much better off going for a late game item. In this case, a blink dagger or a four star, or probably a BKB, so he doesn't instantly die. Four twenty blaze, pops some more spaghetti, but Nicotic just eats him. GG finally being called. Joey with a pentacle lineup, able to pull out a win and make it look easy. This is the team that's going all the way to the top. Thirty one minutes in. There you have it. Joey commanding 2-0 streak against Central Salamanders. Central Salamanders, once again, a few slight uh, issues with their build, especially with the fact that Invoker went for that split build. You have to commit either to the Zoo Invoker build and go for the Necronomicon as early as possible, or if you go for the Ganking Invoker where you go for the Yule Scepter, you need to build items that help you work around that. Early rotations were absolutely disastrous, especially with... As uh, Cyrillic as the Ancient Apparition, just choosing to walk up to the Pudge, say, fight me 1v1, and they get smacked down as a result. Fleezy didn't do too shabby as the offline Weaver, all things considered. But the fact that he went for phase boots opposed to Treads, and then went for the early Maelstrom on the Weaver, it's a squishy item on a squishy hero that doesn't really provide you much damage. It's Weaver, he's one of the few heroes that goes for Lincolns as a fighting item, since he already has all the damage from Gemini Attack and from Sakuchi that all he needs is survivability and sustain, so he can constantly spam it out in his fights, so it makes him even more slippery, it means that Weaver with a 20 minute Lincolns can just run at your supports, they can't do anything. In this case, Oranges, the 5 position Shadow Fiend, doing a fair amount of work with only 2 deaths to his name, all things considered. So that looks like that'll be it for now, if you've enjoyed tonight's broadcast, do subscribe to the UGC channel on Twitch, twitch.tv slash UGC League, 
on 49 community shoutcaster for the UGC League for the Eastern Invite, as well as the uh, Asian scene for so the Australia, New Zealand, and Oceania region. That looks like that'll be it for now, so I'll be signing out. Have a good night.